Okay, a good morning to all of you who are here in the class and good morning to those of you who are online. Uh, let's get started. So yes, we looked at 2 Kings and uh, today we will get into Chronicles. Uh, what is the difference between uh, Kings and Chronicles? Uh, the main thing is that um, you have a doubt. True, there are things mentioned in Chronicles, details given in Chronicles which are not mentioned in Kings. And also, um, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings and 2 Kings talk more about the political history, whereas uh, Chronicles tend to, tends to focus more on the religious aspects, especially of the Davidic dynasty. So uh, that's the main uh, difference between these two. Um, so 1 and 2 Chronicles focuses more on the religious aspects and it focuses on the Davidic dynasty, not on the northern kingdom. Uh, so those are the main things that we need to remember regarding Chronicles. Um, the events which are covered in First Chronicles will be during the time period 1000 to 960 BC, which is basically the time period which is covered also in Second Samuel. So the events in Second Samuel and the events which are mentioned over here in First Chronicles will be similar. But like I said, there are details which are given here in Chronicles, which are not mentioned you know, in Samuel and in the other places. Um, we also see that the last two verses of Second Chronicles are identical. This, the wording is the same as the first three verses of Ezra. So the last two verses of Chronicles and the first three verses of Ezra have the same wording which is why people generally say that Ezra must have, you know, edited and compiled first and second Chronicles. And so he ends it with those words and uses the same wording again to begin Ezra. Okay, so um, he is most probably the editor, the compiler of all the records, of all the historical records. And he places emphasis, of course, on the religious aspects uh, because of his priestly background. Uh, also, we see that uh, the genre of this Chronicles, it's mainly, of course, history. I mean, you have narrative history and you also have genealogies. There are many genealogies mentioned in, um, in the book of Chronicles. The chapters 1 to 9 of First Chronicles is entirely genealogies. So if you just very quickly turn in your Bibles, you know, to uh, First Chronicles chapters 1 to 9, each tribe's genealogy is given in detail. And we need to remember that for the uh, Israelites, this was the last book of their Bible, the Hebrew Bible. The very last book in the Hebrew Bible would be Second Chronicles, First and Second Chronicles. And um, so the, their Old Testament, or, or rather their Bible, ends with the genealogies, the, a detailed list of all the tribes' genealogies. And then when we come to the New Testament, you have the genealogy of Jesus Christ being mentioned. So it's like as if when the uh, you know final last book of the Old Testament was written, it's like as if the priests and the prophets were preparing themselves for the arrival of the Messiah. And so they put out a detailed list of all the genealogies so that when the Messiah comes, it will be very, very clear through which ge genealogy, through, through which lineage he is coming. Okay, so all the preparations are being done and finalized over here in the account of Chronicles. And of course, they had not divided it into first and second Chronicles. It was just one single book of Chronicles. And now, um, key personalities in first Chronicles would mainly be David. And you have uh, mention of Solomon being made. So chapters 1 to 9 we saw talks about the genealogies. Uh, the speciality is that it doesn't just start with Abraham. Here the genealogies are right from Adam himself. Okay, so um, we see that, um, you know, unique feature over here. Also, of course, chapters 10 to 29 focus more on the um, building of the new temple, the temple which is going to be constructed. 
and uh, there's a brief mention of Solomon because the book ends with his uh, kingship. Now, um, something that we should uh, remember regarding uh, Chronicles, why was it written? It was written to encourage the people. Why did the people need encouragement? What happens is that when the people are taken into captivity to Babylon, uh, the people of Judah, when they are taken into captivity, um, they stay over there for a long time. They're, they're given a lot of freedom over there in Babylon to conduct trade, to build their houses, to have their farms. Uh, so they become very prosperous over there in the land of uh, Babylon. And so when uh, finally Cyrus gives his orders and says, those of you who want to return back to your homelands, you're free to go back. Many of the people are not willing to go back. They're so nicely established. They have their big bungalows. They have their uh, large orchards and you know uh, gardens and fields and all of that. And they have their nice you know uh, merchant trading um, companies all set up. So many of them are not even ready to go back. It's only a small number, a small percentage, which has this love for Yahweh. And they want to go back to the land of Yahweh. They want to go back and rebuild the temple. They want to be there in his presence. So it's only a small percentage of people who actually volunteer to come back to Jerusalem after you know, Cyrus gives permission. So it's not that the people are excited to come back. A lot of them do not even want to come back. And uh, so we see that um, these people uh, who had first been taken away to Babylon, they spread out from there to other places. Now, when we look at uh, the book of Jeremiah, we'll also see that's one small section. They go to uh, Egypt and settle down over there. So you have Israelites living in Babylon. You have Israelites living in Egypt. And then, of course, you know, there were these uh, 10 tribes which had gone to Assyria. And so the, the people of Israel kind of spread out over other areas as well. You find them in Elam, in Persia, in uh, parts of Asia Minor, you know, where they're almost entering into Europe. Uh, so you have them spread out in uh, over all of these places. And uh, many of them continued to, of course, not the 10 northern tribes. The 10 northern tribes completely got mixed up with the uh, heathen nations. And we don't even know what happened to them. But the Judahites and the Benjamites, who went and settled in many of these other countries, they maintained their Jewish identity. They continued to uh, say that they are followers of Yahweh, but they did not want to come back to Jerusalem because life would be difficult in Jerusalem because Jerusalem was now in a very bad state, in a very um, uh, undeveloped condition. And so many of them were not keen on returning back home, but they maintained contact with the people who returned back. Okay, so uh, in Upper Egypt, there's this place called Elephantine. And uh, so there are ancient letters which have been found from the 5th century BC. And in these letters, we see that there was communication going on between the Jews who had returned back to Jerusalem and the Jews who were still enjoying their comfort and life in Egypt and Babylon and all of that. So we see that they continue to maintain contact with their Jewish identity and with their people, but they did not really come back. So the few people who came back were very discouraged when they returned home. There was no you know, red carpet welcome. Things were in a very bad state. The walls of Jerusalem were all broken down. Uh, the temple had been completely destroyed. All of these things, because of that, the people were in a discouraged condition. And First and Second Chronicles was written specifically to remind them of their past history, of the great history which they had had, where God had you know, placed a king on the throne, where God had made promises about an eternal dynasty which will last forever and ever. So First and Second Chronicles was written to encourage these people and remind them of their heritage. Okay, so that's the reason um, these two books were written. So you already had a history in First Kings and Second Kings, but this uh, second history uh, in Chronicles was written as an encouragement to the people uh, who were returning back. Mm. 
so first chronicles focuses more on david and uh, second chronicles focuses more on all the other kings of judah the descendants of uh, david and um, in second chronicles chapter 36 verses 22 to 23 is where it talks about uh, it's like a reminder to them of what god had done through cyrus if we could have one person please read out second chronicles chapter 36 verses 22 and 23 and those of us who are online if we can just follow in our bibles second chronicles 36 22 and 23 yeah yeah we can you know leave out all the details uh the point that i'm making over here is that uh it says so clearly the lord moved the heart of cyrus king of persia so um, in the book of Chronicles, the writer is telling the people, see, you have come back over here. Your land is not in a very good condition. You're feeling discouraged and low. But remember what God has done. He has done something impossible. Up to that time, down the ages, the foreign policy, the international policy of all these you know, um, emperors and kings uh, who were conquering, their policy was always that they would have an iron uh, fist and they were, their rule would be very, very, uh, what, um, you know, uh, anarchic, and there would be a lot of violence involved, and they would see to it that these uh, nations that they are conquering would be in, uh, subjugated and placed in a bad state, all of that. But now, God does something with this conqueror, Cyrus. He moves his heart so that the man comes up with a new international policy which has never existed up to that point of time. So it is something that God did. Now people, uh, you know, secular world may say, ah, oh, yeah, that is a new international policy that he came up with. Brilliant idea, clever man. But uh, we look, if you look at the Bible, it, it says that God moved him to come up with this policy. It's not something that he came up with on his own. And so he decides, I will no longer treat the conquered people in a, you know, in, in a very um, uh, violent manner or treat them as slaves. I will have friendly relations with the people that I conquer so that um, this, uh, there are political benefits involved because uh, when you are trying to you know, control all the kingdoms that you have conquered, it's difficult. It's, it's long distance control you're, which you're trying to do. And uh, those people of those lands may not continue remaining submissive to you. So Cyrus' idea is that if he's friendly towards these nations and he treats them with a gentle hand, they will be willing to continue staying part of his Persian empire and he can continue being the emperor of a vast empire. So yes, he had his own ulterior motives. He had his own selfish motives, but God uses those motives to liberate his people. So, you know, it's a very lovely lesson for the kind of times that we are living in today uh, because all over the world, uh, our Christians are now living under hostile conditions. We have uh, kings and rulers. I mean, we don't usually have kings anymore, but uh, I mean, you know, the people in authority, the ones who are in control, they do have their selfish motives. They do have their ulterior agendas, but God moves them and controls them to come up with policies which will ultimately benefit his kingdom, Lord's kingdom, not what they want. Yes, they will serve their selfish purposes and they will do what they want, but ultimately the one who is above all, who has an eye upon them and upon his church is uh, orchestrating events in such a way that finally in the end it's not their purposes which will be accomplished but kingdom purposes which will be accomplished okay so i'm not saying that cyrus was a great and noble man who had love for the people and so he said you know you can go back to your homelands he said that not just to the you know Israelite people, he said that to the other nations also that he had conquered. Uh, so he was not doing it out of any good intentions, but God used him. God manipulated him, you could say. God moved his heart and made him work in a particular way 
to accomplish his kingdom purposes because he is going to be sending out the messiah one day and everything should be ready and in place for the messiah to come and so for that it was very important that the exile should come back home they should rebuild the temple and uh, all the temple processes and rituals which point towards jesus christ should once again start functioning and operating so god had higher purposes so you and i you know as we are living in um, you know states um where we may not have the support of those in authority remember god is god's eyes are constantly on his church he knows what he is doing okay even as we have all kinds of bills and laws being passed which are hostile to the christian community we need not worry because the lord is moving hearts and is manipulating hearts and he knows what to do which is why it says in psalm 2 when the kings and authorities conspire against god he laughs he finds it very amusing he thinks oh, okay these little little people are thinking that they are doing something very great and they are destroying my kingdom and he laughs because he's so amused because he knows that he you know their hearts are in his hands and he can manipulate any way that he wishes to so all of those things are being brought out to these people you know who have come back to the land so in first chronicles second chronicles it talks about the majesty of their god of how he took kings and placed them on the throne some of them were faithful some of them were faithless but through all of those events you can see god's hand god in control god leading events in such a way that what he wants will be accomplished in the end so this was a history that was prepared for the returned exiles to encourage them okay um coming to the you know first nine chapters which are full of genealogies uh, in great detail uh, they served mainly three purposes why were these genealogies included first of course because when they returned back to jerusalem and reoccupied the entire area of juda and benjamin they would have to prove that earlier when my ancestors were here this was the piece of land which belonged to them so each of them should be very very clear who uh, who their forefathers were so each of them would have to be able to establish clearly and say see i have descended from this particular lineage so these records helped uh you know them to settle down in the correct places so that they can reclaim the land which was originally uh, given to them if you see in leviticus 25 23 it says over there god says you know this land belongs to me i am the owner of this land and i'm giving it out to all of you as tenants the land is mine but you're going to be living in it as my tenants we would see that in leviticus 25 23 so now they have come back over here and they have come back as tenants to reoccupy the places which god has assigned to them so the genealogies would have been very very helpful in uh, helping each of them to find out where exactly they fit where their uh, you know clan is supposed to settle down in the land another important role which these genealogies would have played is that many of them were keen on joining the priestly uh, you know um, community and uh, working on the temple and then later on performing temple duties and so it was very very important that they should be able to clearly show that they belong to one of the priestly lineages okay so um, each of those families which came forward and said earlier our ancestors used to be priests they had to prove to which lineage do i belong who are my forefathers and what exactly were their priestly duties before you know they were all taken into captivity so for all of these things uh, for all these simple practical logistic reasons it was very very important to have these genealogies and of course the bigger purpose of the genealogies is that it would also show that they are not just a small little kingdom of exiles who have now come back home but god had a plan for them right from the time of creation and so that is why the genealogy begins right from adam it doesn't just begin with abraham the genealogy begins with adam to remind them that they're not just some little insignificant nation but god had a plan for them right from the time of adam itself so they had to understand their greatness and the value that they had in god's eyes okay so um 
all of these purposes were served by the genealogies. Um, coming to some of the even, you know, one or two main events, uh, First Chronicles, um, there's a lot of emphasis placed on the sin of David when he takes the uh, population count. And that is mentioned in First Chronicles chapter 21. And if we could have maybe someone read out that one simple sentence, you know, 21 verse 1. First Chronicles 21 verse 1. Okay, so um, in your version it says that he stood up to move David, is it? The word you used is move? Okay, yeah. Now isn't it interesting? Uh, we looked at God moving the heart of Cyrus. And here you have Satan moving the heart of David. So finally it's up to us to decide whether we are going to be moved by the Lord or whether we are going to be moved by Satan. So if Satan wants to work against the church, if Satan wants to work against some wonderful ministry that is going on, he tries to move one or two people. Now you should be careful that you are not one of those, that you will not allow yourself to be moved. Why did David get moved by Satan? Because he, he wanted to know, God has given me so much success. I have finally, after all that I went through, you know, all the times that I ran in that desert, like when uh, vagabond, homeless person, nobody to even speak up for me, defend me. I was in that pathetic condition. And now finally I am the king. And I, you know, uh, so um, he wanted to find out exactly how big is his army now. How many soldiers are there? You know, because 20 years and above are the people who are going to fight in the army whenever there is a war. So he wants to know now how big is his army. He wants to kind of take pride in it. And maybe it would also make him feel more secure. So with these intentions, he decides that he's going to count the number of people. And Joab is commander in chief not a very noble man. In fact, even he has the brains to say, is this a good idea what you are doing? The Lord may not approve of what you are doing. So even Joab gives a warning and says, maybe you shouldn't take up this. But David has allowed himself to be moved in his heart by Satan. Yes, uh, And so look at what Satan uses. He uses things like pride, he uses things like insecurity, he uses things like greed, these are all things which he uses to move, to try and move our hearts. And we need to be careful. We need to be alert. Okay, so here we have David taking this wrong step. And uh, Joab, in fact, is so upset that um, the king has ordered something like this. It says in verse 6, he deliberately refuses to do the numbering of the tribe of Jacob, Benjamin. So how many other soldiers there are in the tribe of Benjamin? He doesn't even bother counting them and including them in the final count. Okay, and um, um, the Lord, of course, is very angry because of the, uh, of the attitude of David's heart. And the Lord says, I know, look at this, God's graciousness. He says, I will allow you to choose the punishment. Now, many of us, when we mess up, we don't really get a choice on what kind of punishment we are going to get. But here is a man who has walked with the Lord, you know, um, in such close relationship that God says, I will give you a choice. You choose which kind of punishment you want. So the first one is, of course, uh, three months, uh, three years of famine. Then you have three months of, you know, warfare or three days of plague, which God himself will send through his angel of death. You know, so this, uh, so uh, David says, um, Chances are that the Lord will show mercy. Army will not show mercy. And uh, even this, if there's a famine, there's nothing that can be expected from a famine. But if, the, if I'm in the Lord's hands, there's a chance that the Lord will show mercy. And so he chooses the third option. And uh, so the plague begins. And it says in verse um, 14, 70,000 men of Israel die during that plague. And finally... Uh, when the plague has reached this particular point, the threshing floor of Arauna, the Jebusite, that is when the Lord says, enough, you know, no more. So um, that is mentioned in verse 17. Okay, the Lord says, enough, withdraw your hand. And the angel of the Lord stops. And the Lord sends instructions through the 
prophet Gad to David saying, come over here and build an altar and make your offerings. You know, repent of what you have done. So immediately David comes over there to that place. And when he comes over there, uh, you have Arona who is threshing wheat. And it's very interesting. I really like um, verses 20, 21. Uh, if someone could read out. So we are looking at uh, First Chronicles 21. So verses 20 and 21. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just get to that question which is there in the chat, but let me just finish this. Um, yeah, so God had said that the plague would last three days. So I'm assuming that this is probably the second day or the third day. And people have been dying left and right, you know. And um, um, now Arona, he's busy threshing wheat. And he looks up and he sees the angel standing over there. And he knows why the angel has come to, you know, to kill he must have got the fright of his life. I mean, see, for the past one day, for the past two days, people have been dying all over the city. And now the angel is literally over there. And it says the four sons went and hid themselves. They were so scared. And then uh, David comes and he says, you know, I want to purchase this place so that I can uh, you know, build an altar and make sacrifices. So the Lord will stop. And Arona says, just take it. Take it all for free. I mean, you know. Uh, what does money matter when it's a matter of life and death? But then David says, how can I just take something for free and you know, build an altar over there? I want to purchase it, you know, pay the full price, and then I will you know, make my offering over there. And so he places the um, offering upon the altar. He builds the altar, places the offering upon the altar. And then it says in verse 26, no human being comes and lights the fire. It says the Lord himself brings down fire from heaven and the burnt offering is burnt by the Lord, indicating that he has accepted the offering, that he is now ready to forgive and stop the plague. And as soon as the Lord accepts the offering, in verse 27, it says, the angel of the Lord put his sword back into its sheath and the plague stops. Okay, so, and then you have something interesting mentioned in verse 29. It talks about where the tabernacle of the Lord has been all these days. It's been in the place called Gibeon. But it says David did not have the guts to go to Gibeon because he's so scared that the, uh, this angel uh, of the Lord may still take action against him. And so he just you know, offers his offerings of thanksgiving to God right there at that threshing floor of Arona. He does not go to Gibeon. So I'm not sure how many... Uh, months it took him for you know to work up the guts to go back to Gibeon but he understands that he cannot play with God so um, the question which was asked over here in the chat was why was God you know upset when he took a survey the thing was it was not just a survey and Joab clearly understood that that is which is why Joab gives him a warning it was not just a survey to find out how his land is placed and how things are, how many, how much the population is in different areas. No, he very clearly wants to know how many fighting men he has, how many soldiers he has, how big his army is. So it's either out of to show off, you know, and boast to himself and to himself and say, "Ha, ah, these are the number of people I have," or it is to make himself feel safe and think, "Okay, I have this many people, so now I think I am safe." So whether it is insecurity which makes him do it or whether it is pride which makes him do it, his reliance is upon the people, not on the Lord. And someone who had gone through the experiences that he had gone through should have had more brains. Okay, so which is why the Lord is, you know, when, when um, people who are not very close with God commit a uh, sin, the Lord is more lenient with them because their knowledge is less. They know little about the Lord. But when the Lord, uh, you know, um, sees someone who is very close to me and who really understands his heart and they rebel against him and disobey him, the consequences are always higher. You know, like we see in the case of Moses, 
the lord is very strict with moses in punishing him because moses was somebody that god spoke to like as if he was his friend and it's the same over here with david david was someone who knew the lord intimately and so someone like him should not have uh, done that uh, that um, population count because it was actually him counting the number of soldiers and he had put his reliance on his army rather than on the lord and the lord was displeased uh, with that uh, so then other thing that we can maybe look at you know while we are still in first chronicles uh, maybe regarding the background of jerusalem now just as a kind of um, quiz question when is jerusalem mentioned for the very first time in the old testament in case you know you, you've come across that in any of your sunday school quizzes and all of that the very first time the jerusalem is mentioned in the bible and it's not even mentioned with the name of jerusalem so that would be um, um, genesis chapter 14 verse 18 okay so if we could have someone read out genesis 14:18 Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the place which is mentioned over there, Salem or Salem or however we pronounce it, that is actually Jerusalem. So the first time Jerusalem is mentioned in the Old Testament is over here in this particular verse. Melchizedek was actually the king of Jerusalem, a godly man, a godly king. But then later you have um, other pagan kings coming and taking over that area. Because the next time you have Jerusalem mentioned, that would be in Joshua chapter 10, verses 1 to 5. And over there, uh, you have someone named Adoni Zedek. He is the king of Jerusalem at that time. And he is very, very worried because he gets to know that the Gibeonites have made a peace treaty with Joshua. You know, you remember, right? They trick uh, they trick Joshua into thinking that they are from a faraway land and he enters into a peace treaty with them. And so now Adoni Zedek of Jerusalem, when he finds out that the Gibeonites have made a peace treaty with Joshua, he is worried because the Gibeonites were very powerful warriors. They were a royal city of warriors. And so he thinks now onwards Joshua is going to use them in his army and we are all finished. If the Israelite army and the Gibeonite army gather together and they start fighting the rest of us, we are all finished. And so he forms a partnership with four other kings. And all these five kings, they decide to come and attack Joshua and his people. And that is the occasion where Joshua says to the Lord, Lord, please make the sun slow down so that the moon will continue to be seen in the sky so that both the sun and the moon are visible in the sky for a long, for many, many hours. And then these five kings will know that it's God who is in charge and it's a bad omen for them. You know, we talked about the, about the cultural significance of that in those days and all of that. So, um, of course, we know that, uh, you know, that all the five kings are completely defeated. But after the five kings were defeated, it looks like they did not gain control of Jerusalem. Jerusalem continued to be under the control of Adoni Zedek because after the death of Joshua in Judges chapter 1, verses 4 to 8, we see at that time they once again go up against the city of Jerusalem and this time they try to burn it down. Okay, so um, that is when Jerusalem temporarily comes under their control. So we see that in Judges 1, 4 to 5. And at that time, the king is somebody named Adoni Bezek. Now, I don't know whether it's the same man or whether it's his son or it's a different person, but uh, they capture him. And it says in Judges chapter 1, verse uh, 6, that they cut off his thumbs and big toes. That was like a sign of disgrace. It's like saying that from now on, you are no longer an independent king, but now you are. Uh, I know under the control of your conquerors and so this is what Adoni Bezek says in verse 7 he says 
Seventy kings with their thumbs and big toes cut off have picked up scraps under my table. Now God has paid me back for what I did to them. Okay, so we have all of those details given. So that is basically when Jerusalem comes under the control of the Israelites and it becomes one of the cities of Benjamin. Okay, the Benjamin, the Benjamite tribe gets that particular city under them. And but you still have Jebusite people continuing to live in the city, and the city is not completely under Israelite control because we see uh, finally when we come to First Chronicles chapter 11 verses 4 to 9 that is when david decides i am going to make this place my capital and so he decides to go and defeat all the jebusites who are still left in that place and what do those people say to him uh first chronicles chapter 11 uh, verses 4 and 5 and maybe even 6 if someone could read out first chronicles chapter 11 Verses 4, 5, 6. Okay, so um, the walls of Jerusalem were very, very strong at that time. And one very attractive thing regarding Jerusalem was that you had underwater, um, you know, underground, not under, underwater, underground water sources. Okay, so in case the city gets completely surrounded by the enemy and they are kept captive inside, you know, they cannot go in and out they are stuck inside for many many months or even more than a year they will still be able to survive because you have underground water sources so that is the main attraction for of jerusalem it is a very good place to have as a capital and so probably god gives david the wisdom to make that his capital city and so we have uh, david going and conquering it and from that time onwards jerusalem finally comes under the full control of the Israelites. Okay, so that's just regarding the background of the city of uh, Jerusalem. All right. Um, anyone has any questions? Otherwise, we can actually conclude. No. I do not know about you online students, but my students here don't seem to be very happy with First Chronicles. It's not really something which met their approval. All right, uh, no questions. We can actually close with the word of prayer. Let's close with the word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you so much for um, the lessons that you teach us through your word. We thank you, O oh Lord, for the lessons that we can learn even from the negative story of David and the mistake which he made. We pray, O oh Lord, that when um, Satan tries to tempt us and move us, we pray, O oh Lord, that we would remain strong in you. Because, Lord, the wrong decisions that we take can affect all the people around us as well. And so we pray, Lord, that you would help us to be uh, on guard. Also, Lord, we thank you that um, even as you brought the exiles back from captivity, you encouraged them, O oh Lord, and you showed them the great promises that they have in you, even though their current condition was not very good. So we pray, O oh Lord, in the same way, we would always remember that if currently things are not going well for us, we can always look back to the past and remember the great things which you have done for your people and for the church. And that, Lord, would give us the encouragement and strength to hold on to you, O oh Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much, online students. And thank you for all of you who have been listening patiently.